outro cast. Getting this started here, a pleasure to be speaking with you on my end. How's your day going aside from having to do interviews and all that? Uh, I mean, great. It's raining, but I'm inside and it's cozy and I've been writing some music of my own and, you know, everything's great. You've been writing music of your own like every damn day. You're one of those people who has like six projects going at the same time and we kind of find out about them like two years after you do them, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even Cobweb... Um, I finished it last May, but started working on it 2021. Yeah, it's been a long ride, um, but the right now I'm working on my second record. So, and it's been nice. I've just dedicated a big chunk of time to it. Um, so it's been really fun. Before I come back to it, the first record was passed inside the present. It was uh, on Pass Inside the Present as the label. Um, it was called Natura, but yeah, it came out in 2022, came out last spring. Right. So you mentioned Cobweb and I just did the junket for that. So you're one of those people where I get the press release where sometimes it's from the label putting out your soundtrack. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's from the studio that's putting out the soundtrack. Sometimes it's for your own music. Sometimes it's something that you worked on with Ian, etc. How are you able to juggle all these projects at the same time? Because a lot of if we're talking about a traditional singer songwriter, usually they can only do one album at a time emotionally. Yeah, so when I was working on Cobweb and my first record, um, I was also working on another horror movie called They Slash Them. Um, I was also working on Roslyn, um, which was a 20th century um, film. And it was, if I think of it now, I don't know how that period of time worked. Um, I think it was, a, a lot of it is just kind of like micromanaging and just being like, today is this project's day. Mm -hmm. And this is, days, you know, just kind of dividing up the week until there's a frantic email. And then once the frantic email comes in, you just kind of shift your attention. Yeah. Um, but the flow of them all worked pretty well because it's like, um, you know, you work on one project and you do like a bunch of cues and then you send them off and you usually have like a day or two before you get feedback. So then in those day or two, you work on something else and you just kind of, you know, find these little gaps where you can work on other stuff. Um, and thankfully, none of them ended at the same exact time. So it was like they each ended like two or three weeks away from each other, if not more. Um, so somehow I was able to juggle it. I don't know. I don't think I slept much those, um, you know, that chunk of time, which was, I guess, uh, early 2022. Um, but, you know, it's just one when you feel like you have the momentum going with film work. Um, it's such a blessing and I'm so grateful and it's like you just you can't stop you know you can't that's not the moment to stop so I just felt like it was a moment to push through um, and um, you know it's great when you start to see the results of that hard work already in yeah. you know things that I'm getting pitched for and the projects coming up you know so it's it was all worth it. <laughs> Dickinson good mm -hmm. girls I know what you did last summer millions of people are hearing your music whether or not they know it's come from you but one thing that i'm super curious about is when you have a husband and wife who are in the same field but mm -hmm. do different things how does your recording rig and studio compare to ian's so we have very much the same sort of like basic setup in terms of like computer in actually same interface in patch bay same power conditioner so like when it comes to kind of like the basics those are identical mm -hmm. um apart from that i think the biggest difference is the use of what what we use you know like um i had a lot of modular synths and smaller sort of like gadgety things you know like i have this little synth called an op1 um mm -hmm. i have all of these little like toy percussion things um and just sort of more like synth based um and then Ian, I mean, he's got plenty of big synths, but then he's got guitar, drum kit. Um, so I think we just, we we differ in sort of like our tool set um, and toolkit, which is nice when we get to come together. But then it's also great because when we work separately, then we have our own sound. Yeah. Um, but on, on a technical level, what we've tried to do is have our computers be as similar with software as they can be to each other. Just so when we do work together, if we have to go from one computer to another. So there's been there's been conscious effort to have there be sort of like a duplicate setup up until like the creative tools are involved, I guess. Got it. Well, can I throw a compliment now or, you know, no compliments today? Sure. Yeah, I'll take a compliment. 
Okay, so I admire that you really paid your dues. You know, you studied your craft at Berkeley, and then initially you weren't the composer. You had to graduate from music assistant to, you know, co-composer before you could be the composer. But was the project that kind of launched you, was it Love and Bananas or was it the first Monday in May? What was the beginning of you being the featured composer? Um, I think I think it must have been the first Monday in May, um, because up until then, I was working on music mainly for fashion brands. And I was doing a lot kind of in the fashion world, um, just because it seemed like a good way to get my feet wet with writing for picture, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, the first Monday in May was kind of like the first was my first feature length. Um, and it was a documentary and it had to do with fashion. And it's sort of like bridged the gap. Um, and then, yeah, there was a couple of documentaries. There was uh, Love and Bananas. There was one called Invisible Hands that I worked on, um, The Gospel According to Andre. And so like documentaries were kind of like the 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 gateway in. And then the really big uh, break, I would say, is Dickinson. I mean, getting season one of Dickinson was huge. Um, and subsequently after that came season three of Good Girls. And then um, from there, you know, things just kind of took off. Um, and now I'm doing, I feel like I'm, I lately have been doing more features, mm -hmm. uh, which I like. I, I'm, I'm actually enjoying the way that feature, the structure of features more so than television. Um, and I know for some people, it's a total opposite because they love the schedule of TV, but I sort of love the chaos of narrative <laughs> of features and whatnot. Yeah, you're also doing it the opposite of way of most of the composer I, uh, I'm speaking with. Most of them, they had the major label deal then they went into the composing. In your case, the composing, and now you're doing the solo records or the artist records. Yeah, it's interesting. I've released some, I released some music at the same time as um, the scoring stuff, but then I just never had time to like, and also I just don't think I had the, the, the sonic tools that I wanted to do a full length. So last year felt like a really good time to put out like my first full length, uh, as opposed to like the little EPs that I put out before. But yeah, I talked, I mentioned to people that the, my career, the artists in the scoring career are kind of like, they've constantly been kind of like going like this. Um, and I feel like the scoring right now is definitely sort of taken off a little bit. Um, but it's nice to have them grow at the same time, because I feel like that way, it's like, I'm still able to establish my sound with my artist project and my releases so that then I can get hired on things that sound like that. But then I'm not like missing out on touring opportunities because that's not like the sort of thing that I'm going for. So it's 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 been working out really well to work for other people and then have my own outlet and have it all kind of come together, to be honest. I really enjoy the drums and lace name, the whole pun of <laughs> all that. Do you find that people are still confused where they just see one person? They go, wait, where's lace? Yes, a little bit. I feel <laughs> like at the beginning they would confuse Ian and I as being that is a duo but now I think dare I say I'm established just enough for people to like put yeah. that together um and also I mean I do think if anything it's a name people remember because it like the play on yeah. word as much as it's silly and sometimes I'm like oh I wish I could change my name to something else but it does people do remember it and it does have a ring to it um I don't know so I feel like it's it's a, a blessing and a curse <laughs> Well said. So I think I read this. I'm curious if this is true, because you never know if Wikipedia is correct. Like the other day I was interviewing somebody and I said, so you were born in Mexico. And they went, no, you must have read my Wikipedia. I was not born in Mexico. I oh. can't get it fixed. You never know. So I was reading that with your musical evolution that you started off as a classic rock person, then you found Radiohead and that's where all the indie stuff happened. Is that true? Yeah, so I, um, in high school, I had this super huge kind of like 60s, 70s rock moment, um, you know, like Led Zeppelin, The Who, you know, you name it, like Black Sabbath, like all of that. And um, I feel like it wasn't, you know, and that kind of led to like the strokes and that sort of more poppy stuff. And then it wasn't until I think it was the end of high school that I uh, heard Pablo Honey, which is kind of like the perfect segue because it's the most kind of like indie rock record of Radioheads. And from there, all of a sudden I was like listening to Bjork and then that just kind of like, 
and then Aphex Twin. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, and now I'm all the way over here. And I mean, I still love rock, classic rock. Um, went through sort of like a metal phase in college as well. Mm. So it was sort of like IDM and like very like cerebral music and metal. <laughs> Um, but I think it all kind of factors into how I write music and just kind of like musical structure and the the idea of noise as music. I don't know. It all kind of like works together. But I do think that Radiohead is really like the pivot band that kind of like led me led me astray um, for, for, for the best, to be honest. I'm finding if the composer is over, say, 45 years old, it was Van Halen that got him into stuff. And then if they're under 45, it was Radiohead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's safe to say. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> was Van Halen part of that hard rock phase? Or when you say metal, you're meaning like Opeth? So a little bit of both. So I definitely gone to a few Opeth shows in my in my uh, in my <laughs> life. A random <laughs> name I could pull because Opeth, half the albums sound like Radiohead and then half of them sound like screaming metal. Yeah, you know, I always like the more atmospheric ones, to be honest. But no, I definitely, it, it, within that metal thing, there was definitely a contingency of like Van Halen and Iron Maiden, um, you know, kind of adjacent like Metallica, even though they, you know, they weren't considered as like hair metal as that. But yeah. definitely not all of the White Snake, and I know all of all of it. <laughs> uh, White Snake, I'm gonna say, holds up. Oh, he oh yeah, his voice, yeah. Sebastian Bach is a freaking god of voice <laughs> of vocal skid, technique skid row holds up white snake holds up certain bands of those you don't of that era you don't have to be embarrassed to talk about so no uh, no no i agree <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to know that because a lot of people would go you know you have to play your sonic youth card when you're talking with some people to show that you're cool but you can't yeah. just say openly like oh yeah i love white snake they're gonna think you're kidding no, I mean, I think there's really a time, I think the cultural significance of it is like humongous. I mean, it has such a huge, like it could have only been in the 80s. I mean, think yeah. about like everything that came with the 80s, even like the whole like American psycho business world. I mean, it's all so fascinating that we ever had men running around in spandex with like huge hairstyles. I mean, how, what is it not to love? right <laughs> exactly so uh down to the last two three questions before i let you go and the first one is i can imagine you're just working every day based on the output that you put out there you, you know most songwriters if they write 12 songs in a year that was a crazy year for them on top of the 30 gigs in your case it's kind of like four albums worth of material we're going to get from you usually at least when you have downtime what do you do when I have downtime, I go for long walks. Uh, now I live in London, so I live really close to some beautiful marshes. So um, even this morning, I went for like a two hour walk with my dog. Um, so I do that traveling, um, something that I love to do. Um, when I still lived in LA, I used to do a lot of hiking or, you know, yoga type stuff. Um, I want to try to get back into reading. That's something that I have honestly haven't read like a full book in so long. It's really embarrassing. Um, but the downtime is really spent, I mean, when I'm not writing music, I'm usually watching movies. Um, I watch a lot of TV. I watch a lot of movies. Um, it's that and then mixed with like being in nature. I think just like physically being outside of my house um, mm -hmm. is kind of like the way way to go. Well, that actually feeds into the next thing I want to know, which is your day job involves watching television. And some people do the exact opposite of their day job in their free time. But do you have a TV recommendation or a thing or two that we should be watching, even if it's something you wrote the music for? I'm, I'm open to it. Oh, well, I mean, like everyone else, uh, I'm waiting for season two of Severance because I thought that that was absolutely excellent. Television and music. Um, I've been enjoying Yellow Jackets a lot, um, which I just finished watching the season. Um, what else has been really good? Um, I recently found a TV show called Dairy Girls that's on Netflix. Oh, yes. New it's Zealand. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, Irish, but still, it's just so funny. Oh, and Dairy so Girls. Oh, Dairy Girls. Yeah. I'm sorry. There's a there's a comedy, a New Zealand comedy about these women that work on a dairy. But you're saying oh. Dairy Girls from Ireland. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's yeah. Dairy Girls is a good show. Um, 
Also, I'm excited for season four, I think, of Sex Education. It's another really witty show. Um, I don't know. I feel like a lot of the things I've been watching lately are a little bit more light. Um, obviously, watch Succession and Barry and, you know, all, all of sort of like the zeitgeisty things. Um, but I feel like, yeah, that was all really good. And a movie that I watched recently that I was really surprised about was Tetris. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm very surprised to be saying this out loud, but it was like actually enjoyable. And the music was cool because it's like recreated sort of like 8-bit, you know, Nintendo um, music. But yeah, I don't, li it's it's funny. I don't listen to recorded music. I just, on my during my free time, but I watch tons of movies and TV just because, mm. I don't know, I love it. Um, and might actually go on a quest i've been trying to watch drop dead gorgeous again and it's not on streaming anywhere it's crazy how that happens we've got to hold on to physical media that's all yeah. Going on. yeah rights management or wait for the 15th anniversary edition or whatever right or 20th <laughs> I don't know. yeah whatever it is anyway and, and the last question i have for you and this is also a compliment of of sorts is you're friendly with other composers and a lot of industries within the arts comics can be friends with each other but they're usually competing they're going oh why is he headlining theaters and i'm in clubs oh why did he get the sitcom i should and so you're friendly with other composers i'm curious when you kind of realized that you weren't competing with the other people in the film and television and video game space that you're all kind of peers and you all offer something different and you can be friendly yeah, I mean, I think it just comes down to like everyone in the industry, the, everyone has a voice, you know, and I think once you get to know someone enough, you realize that if they've made it this far, then they've been authentic to themselves and they've been using this authentic voice. And it's like, I could never sound like them. They could never sound like me. And I mean, I do think that there's there's obviously space to be a little bit envious. I mean, you know, being envious is like, part of human nature but at the same time I think that if you can have friendships that are strong enough where you can be happy for somebody and that feeling overwhelms any other um and I've been lucky enough to like the people that I'm friends with in the industry I'm just honestly I'm just psyched for them to be doing well and I'm just excited to you know as somebody that loves to watch things I'm just excited to watch something even if I didn't work on it so um and also it's just it is a you know as much as we do, we are quote unquote competition. Like it is a community. It's really nice to have people to talk to if you have a question and it's just, you know, you don't, you don't, you can't advance in a career in the arts if you don't support your community. So um, that's, yeah. That, that is the line of the damn day, Sophia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for the many years of great art and thank you for your time and really looking forward to whatever is coming next, whether it's a TV score, a film score, a solo album, a t whatever it is, just keep up all the greatness out there. Thank you so much for having me and thank you. Outro cast. <laughs>